Good morning, God's beloved. It is so good to see you this morning. Welcome to everyone who is here in the sanctuary and everyone who is joining us online as well. After church last week, I realized something felt very different, and then I realized I could see everyone's or most people's faces, and that was kind of a, an interesting um, observation. As I just implied, we do have masks optional now, so if you um, would like to ask your neighbor to wear their mask, if, if you are more comfortable with that, or if you'd like to move around, we've got plenty of space in the sanctuary that you can um, space out as you feel comfortable. We do have some new attendance cards. They were on the check-in table as you were coming in, and they, there should still be some in the pew backs as well. Last week, we didn't have everyone fill them out, and so if you could please remember to fill that out so that we know that you are here today, um, and then you, you can leave them either on the pew where you're sitting or as you're exiting um, in the offering plate at the back in the narthex. Um, and if you're joining us online, there is a registration form for you to fill out too. It's in the description of the video. There are a few announcements um, to make about some upcoming events. You may have noticed also on the bulletin and communion table that we are not doing traditional Easter lily um, purchasing this year. They are quite unavailable due to supply chain issues, so we are going to ma be making Easter donations to Micah 6 instead. Uh, so you can do that in honor or in memory of your loved ones and you can fill out that card and leave that in the offering plate as well, or get in touch with Brittany in the office. On Easter Day, that's April 17th, we're going to have an Easter potluck breakfast at 9.30 in the morning. If you'd like to RSVP to come to that or sign up to bring a dish, there are links in the email about that. If you need the, that email, if you're not on our email list yet, please let me know and I can get that to you. We're also collecting donations of Easter eggs, stuffed Easter eggs with candy and whatnot. And the basket that we will be collecting those in is out in the narthex. There's a nice big sign, put your eggs here. So we would love to have uh, everyone who's bringing some, bring about a dozen and think between all of us, uh, we'll be set. There are several neighborhood group gatherings this week, so if you are in one of those groups that are meeting, make sure you watch your email for information. And if you aren't a member of UCC, but you'd like to get connected to whichever neighborhood group is yours, please let me know and we will make that happen. <clears throat> and so now as we listen to the prelude, let us settle into God's presence, preparing our hearts and our minds to be right here, right where we are, welcoming of all of the different people and sounds and thoughts and prayers that come to us today.
Before I say the call to worship, I want to remind us all that liturgy, worship, is the work of the people. And so I am going to ask right now, in real time, for Scarlett Kilborn to please be our acolyte during the first hymn. <laughs> we did not arrange for someone to light the candles during the prelude, so thank you so much. <laughs> Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Now let us stand and sing together our first hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Merciful God, you welcome us back to you again and again. You are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. When we stray from you or resent others, you forgive us. You are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Siblings, today the pastoral prayer is responsive. So when I say, let us pray to the Lord saying, you will respond, Lord have mercy. So let's practice. Let us pray to the Lord saying, Lord have mercy. Beautiful. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God, this morning we come before you with hearts. Some are anxious, some are broken, some are bursting with joy, but all the same, we bring these hearts before you. This morning, we pray for the church throughout the world. We pray that all Christians may embody the reconciling love 
of Christ. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the nations of the world and its leaders, that all may dwell in peace, that justice may be tempered by mercy, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For planet Earth, which is God's greatest gift to us, that all may share wisely in its resources and conserve its riches for our children's children. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For our enemies, that, me, that we may regard them with the reconciling love which is made manifest in Christ, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. God, today we pray for those who are sick, those who are in trouble. We pray for the defenseless, the weak, and the poor, that they may be restored to wholeness of life and livelihood. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. We pray for the lost. We pray for those who have abandoned God. We pray especially for those under the false belief that God has abandoned them. We pray for those who feel as though they have no friends or family. We pray for all who are gripped <coughs> in addiction and other disease. We pray for those who have never known such love, that they may come to know the joy of love's embrace through the actions of the people of this church. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. Loving God, you hear the prayers of your people. You comfort us in times of need. And God, for the sake of our world, we beg, through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. children's moment, I will meet you right here on the steps. <laughs> Hi, Ryan. Okay, so I want to tell you about this time that I got really messy. I was at Southwest Good Samaritan Ministries on a mission trip and I was working outside in all the dirt. And at the end of the day, my legs had so much dirt on them, it looked like I was wearing pants. That's pretty dirty, right? I was wearing just shorts, but it looked like I was wearing pants. Do you ever get messy? Hey, Scarlett, do you ever get messy? Do you ever get messy? Like when you're playing outside, you get messy and dirty. Uh, I get mud. You get mud on you, yeah. Ryan, do you ever get messy? A little bit with dirt. <laughs> so what happens when you get messy? What do you do? Oh, that's right. You get stinky, and the dirt gets stuck to your skin, so you have to wash it off. That's right. When you get dirty, you have to do something to clean up, right? Yeah, so then you have to do laundry. Or your parents do, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes mistakes can make us feel kind of messy, even if we don't actually have dirt on us. 
we might hurt someone's feelings or do something we're not supposed to, and it's kind of messy in a way. And so it's good for us to notice when that happens, just like it's good for us to notice when we have a lot of dirt on us, because then we can do something about it and clean it up, right? And God helps us to do that because God forgives us, forgives us and helps us to start fresh. Will you pray with me? <laughs> okay, repeat after me, okay? Dear God, help us notice messes and clean them up. Thank you for helping us start fresh. Amen. I'm so glad to see y'all. This morning's scripture reading is from the chapter of Luke, or book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 3 and 11b through 32. 
Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in, his father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him? Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. May God richly bless the reading of these words. Will you pray with me? Holy God, pour out your spirit on us this day, that we will hear the word that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As many of you know, this season of Lent, we have been exploring and practicing a variety of spiritual disciplines. The word discipline can have sort of a negative connotation at times, but that is not the case with this. With spiritual disciplines, these are opportunities to open ourselves up to deeper connection with God and then deeper connection to ourselves and deeper connection to our neighbors. So far this season, we have explored fasting, contemplative prayer, last week, Sabbath, and today we look at self-examination. The scripture passage that Suzanne just read so beautifully is so well known 
that I wonder how many of us in this sanctuary kind of started tuning out. We know this story like the back of our hands. But just like what happens much of the time in the practice of Lectio Divina, prayerfully reading the scriptures, we can be open to what God is drawing to our attention here and now, which could be something very different from the way that we've always thought about this story or what we think that we know about it. So this story is not just any story, it's a parable. And as Dr. Amy Jill Levine reminds us in her um, scholarship, including in her book, Short Stories by Jesus, which we studied together at last Lent, parables do not do what we expect them to do. She cautions against allegorizing, so where we would assign different roles to the characters, where the younger son represents the repentant Christian, and the older son represents the Pharisee or the Jewish people, and the father is God. She says, no, no, don't do that. It can take away from other deeper meanings of the story. So we've got this younger son who does not necessarily represent the repentant Christian, and he's foolish for asking for his inheritance early and leaving. There's foolishness in that, but not necessarily sin yet. But then he goes off and he squanders what he has. He is self-indulgent. And then he's living with the consequences. And then we hear in the scripture that he came to himself, or in some translations, coming to himself, and that's when he realizes what he has done and what he could do to get back on the right track. Some hear this part as the younger son being contrite. He's realized what his mistakes have been, and he is going to go set them right. But Amy Jill Levine thinks that maybe Jesus' first century listeners heard him as conniving. Have you ever thought of the younger son as conniving? That was a new one to me. But it came up again when I was reading about another preacher looking at this text that David Luce, he had seen a painting that portrayed this moment where the younger son comes to himself. And the artist didn't show the son as remorseful and sad, but instead as scheming. He knew what he was going to do, like he could con his way back into his father's good graces. Amy Joel Levine again points out that when he says, I have sinned against heaven and before you, that's an echo of Pharaoh's empty words in Exodus to stop the plagues. She says, the prodigal is no more repentant. He has no more change of heart than the Egypt's ruler. So let's just sit with that. Jesus' original Jewish audience hearing this parable likely didn't see the Father as God, like so many of us modern readers today understand it, but she says that if they did see the Father as God, it wouldn't have been this surprising, world-changing, perspective-altering understanding. Because God has loved the wayward since the beginning. And rabbinic literature shows that stories like this often aren't actually about us seeing God's love in a new way. The challenge presented in these stories is about how to get the wayward to return. Jesus says that the, way, the younger son, this wayward son, came to himself and whether or not he was scheming or truly repentant, that was a turning point. He realized that something had to change. 
So these motives are questionable, but whatever it was that spurred him along, the wayward son did go home. which made it that reconciliation was possible. And it sounds like the, the father and the older son might also need to come to themselves to examine it is what they have done, what mistakes they have made, what ego-centered perspectives might be keeping them from healing and wholeness. The practice of self-examination opens up a process that leads to wholeness and repentance. Taking account of our mistakes and our blessings, like the man with the sheep, the woman with the coin, this man who had two sons, taking account moves us to act. With self-examination, we are embarking on an honest inventory of our hearts and our behaviors and our mindsets. It's one tool that helps us to orient ourselves to God, either getting to that place or staying in that God orientation. And self-examination and the confession that is implied in it, it's not about turning in on ourselves and beating ourselves up and, and self-hatred and, and a morose sense of being stuck forever in our unhealthy habits and responses. No, it is about renewal and peace in reconciliation, in union with God. Since it isn't an invitation to despair, author Marjorie Thompson recommends that we keep these two essential truths right in front of us as we engage in self-examination so that it is a healthy, life-giving practice. You might want to make a couple of notes, mental notes anyway. The first truth to keep in front of us as we are engaging in this practice is the truth of God's unconditional love. God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. And the second truth is the fact that we do get off track, disoriented by sin. We aim ourselves toward our self-centered desires, our unmet needs, the illusion of control, rather than aiming ourselves toward God. And repentance, that often is a fruit of self-examination, is turning to God instead of self, turning away from sin and self-centered desires, turning toward God. This practice can feel pretty exposing. It makes us feel vulnerable. We have to think about things that we might not be proud of. And so we don't want to do it. But we can. We are enabled, we are freed to do this because of truth number one, that we are always wrapped up in God's love and there's nothing at all that we can do to earn it or to lose it. And that truth frees us up to admit that truth number two, that we mess up and we don't always love God or ourselves or others as we should. There are a whole bunch of different ways to engage in self-examination. And all of them are not meant to be problem-solving or self-lecturing or psychoanalysis. It is a practice that turns us toward God, helping us to become more God-centered by noticing in our lives all of those moments when we are or are not facing God. So we're going to engage in a little bit of self-examination together here right now. 
This is more in line with um, a daily examine, similar to what we talked about in our Sunday school class this morning, which is a doorway, maybe, to the deeper self-examination of examining what we have done wrong. So this is a practice outlined by the spiritual director and author Tilden Edwards. So to do this together, just first relax, get in a very comfortable position. You can close your eyes if you'd like to, you don't have to. And simply become aware of God's presence. And now think about what has happened in your life recently. In the last day or so, be still and open to the Spirit. And in everything that has happened, listen especially for the graces that you have encountered. When you notice a gift or a grace, observe the nature of it. How was God present in your life in that moment? As you think of it, let yourself feel and express gratitude to God. And now keeping your mind and heart centered on that one moment of grace. Notice how you were present to God or to others during that time. If you become aware that you were not present to God in that moment, if you were unaware of the grace as it was happening, breathe a simple prayer like, Lord, have mercy. And become aware of how you would like to respond differently another time. If you notice that you were aware of the grace in your midst, simply smile to God in, in thanksgiving. Amen. If you go home and do this practice by yourself, you can keep on repeating that for as many moments of grace as come to you. Noticing how God has been with you throughout your day and noticing your own way of, of either noticing or missing or resisting God's presence. And you can also do an inquiry with yourself through this practice. Notice, was there anything significant or surprising over time, do you notice a pattern of how you are or are not present to God? Whatever it is that pushes us to some sort of self-examination, coming to ourselves, turning our faces to God, even if our motives aren't quite what they should be, even if it's half-hearted or tentative at first, over time, the fruits of this will bear out. You'll notice more self-awareness, especially in relation to God's unconditional love. Living more honestly, you'll notice greater compassion for others and for yourself, Maybe paths of reconciliation will open up that didn't seem to be there before. And just a general sense of being more attuned to what is of God. 
Maybe the younger son was sincere in his self-examination and repentance. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe the father and the younger son stopped to account for what they had done or had not done to bring about wholeness and joy. Maybe not. Maybe we will come to ourselves honestly and openly most days. Or maybe that feels too tender most of the time. But either way, any way, God's love is unconditional and without end. We need to remind ourselves of that. And so, to do that right now in this moment, I invite you to turn to your neighbor, and if you don't have someone right next to you, you can look across the way and say to each other, God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. Go. Amen. We have heard the words of a very familiar parable. At different times, we often see ourselves as either son. We have received or demanded blessings to which we are not entitled and squandered them in self-indulgent living. We have also looked out from a place of superiority and privilege and have been indignant over lavish dispensing of love and mercy. At this time, as we contemplate how and what we can offer to meet the many needs of our church, our community, and our world, let us strive to be more like the Father who offers grace and radical, radical hospitality to one in need. As we bring our gifts this day, let us do so in humble repentance, gratitude, and recognition that all blessings in our life come as a gift of grace. You can find options and instructions for giving in the back of your bulletin. Please give as you are able.
Thank you, God, for this parable that Jesus spoke to folk who considered themselves better than they were. We, too, need to hear it. Each of us has been like both of the brothers more than once. Thank you for loving us and accepting us, welcoming us regardless. We offer to you ourselves and our resources. Amen. unsure of the outcome. And while we know that should be most conversations, we should not cast assumptions on our siblings. There is one conversation we can always have that we always know which direction it will go. And that is when we come to God in prayer. That is when we come to God seeking forgiveness and reconciliation. This table serves as a reminder that no matter what happened this week, no matter what will happen in the week to come, we have a seat here. We are welcome to come and to be fed and to be loved beyond measure. Siblings, the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this, this is, is my body, body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. According to his commandment, we remember his death. We proclaim his resurrection. Loving God, as we think of Lent, what we are praying for now is for peace in the world. As we take this bread and cup, let us remember love divine, all loves excelling. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Siblings, we are so grateful that each of you has been gathered here today, either online or in our building. If you do not currently have a church home, or if you do, but it is not here in Austin, but you are in Austin, we welcome you to come forward during the singing of this hymn so that we may welcome you into membership at University Christian Church. Now let's all please rise and sing together. forgiven and that it is your call to do good work in the world. And may the God of all reconciliation bless you, the grace of Jesus Christ keep you, and the power of the Holy Spirit strengthen you body, mind, and spirit. Amen. <laughs> 